um, that's what we're talking about. Um, and this is from a paper I wrote with Dirk uh, last year. Um, so I just put the archive up just in case anyone cares. So what's the deal here? So one. I think if I've judged correctly, people here are coming from a couple of different perspectives. And so I'm going to say some things that will be boring to some people because these are very standard things uh, or things that other people in the room are better experts in. But on the other hand, if I've understood correctly, some people don't know anything about them. So I hope that this will hit the, the mark correctly. Um, so uh, I want to say, I just, I want to start with a little bit like, what are we talking about when we're talking about these cuts in, in quantum field theory, which is something that the two organizers uh, know very well. And I think it's part of the motivation for why <laughs> they got connected up with graph complexes and why this conference even exists at all. Um, so, but, but I don't think this has been said this conference. So hopefully this isn't going to waste too much of your time. Um, and so the, the part of this story that really inspired all this work that related to the complexes that, that Marco and Dirk have done, um, was largely coming from these questions of monodromy, but even before we get to the monodromy cuts are showing up just in the second semantic. So let me just first write down what that is, uh, and then we'll see some pieces that are going to be useful later. So uh, and what is so what is what is the deal with this guy? Um, the deal with this guy is you've got G is going to be a graph. And in my context, my graphs are always Feynman graphs, so they have external edges um, and that whole story. Um, and what's going to happen? Well, let's consider the set of vertices that are incident to an external edge. Those are the external vertices, and let's just give it a name. All right, and let's suppose we have a partition of W into two parts, so a bipartition of W. What can we do? We can define a polynomial. Um, and I don't need notation for it, so I'm not going to define notation for it. Let's just write down what it is. We want to sum over spanning forests. They are compatible with the bipartition. So what the heck does that mean? So what is a spanning force in this context? If you think spanning tree, what is a spanning tree? It's a subgraph of the graph that is a tree and that contains all of the vertices. Containing all the vertices is the word spanning. This is the same thing. It still has the word spanning, but it also has the word forest instead of tree. So the subgraph doesn't need to be connected. Uh, and in particular, isolated vertices are just fine. And then this, again, is a story that many of us are very familiar with. And then what do you put here? You put the usual monomial. You put the monomial of the edges that you're going to cut in order to build this object. Oh, I shouldn't have said the word cut because I don't mean the cut in that kind of a sense, unfortunately. The edges that are not in this cut. <laughs> so that includes the edges that are in the cut in that sense, but also uh, others. So this is E nine. Okay. Um, so that's all fine and good. I know what do you want to do? Well, 
some other day I could have gone on a big digression about spanning force polynomials and some nice stuff you can do with them. Because you could make a similar definition with any subset of vertices and it wouldn't have to be a bipartition, it could be a partition into more parts. Uh, and you can build some nice polynomials and those polynomials are called spanning chorus polynomials. And um, I happen to be quite partial to them. And if I was telling you about C2 or something else, then I would be going on that digression, but I'm not. Because right now I just want to use this as an example of something that's going to show up in the physics, the second semantic polynomial. Um, and to do that, we need to take this polynomial, but we don't actually want just that. We want to multiply by, well, something. So if we um, go back down here, so very briefly for the people who are not used to Feynman diagrams, um, if you want to think of your, let's think of this Feynman diagram uh, in position space, there's some momentum uh, assigned to all of the edges. There's momentum conservation at every vertex. Uh, and so there's the external guys are where momentum is coming in and going out of the graph. Uh, and so in particular, when you have uh, a cut of the graph into multiple pieces, which is defined here, you've got some momentum coming into the, uh, the vertices of the external edges from the first part. And by momentum conservation, you have the same thing in the other one. So you want to do something with that. What do you want to do? You want to build a little guy. Well, we're just going to multiply by the square of the momentum coming in. Um, one part. And so it's the same as the other one. Uh, and this little guy is going to come up later and it's going to be called S. And now that you multiply this guy by that, and then you sum over the different bipartitions, And that gives you your second semantic polynomial. And you can use that as one of the ways that you can write down a Feynman integral for this guy, which I'm not going to write down because we don't need it for right now. Sorry, um, I missed. Um, can, do you mind repeating what is compatible with bipartition? What does that mean again? Oh, sorry. Yeah. And I may not have said this clearly. So, uh, compatible with the bipartition means the spanning force has exactly as many trees as parts of the partition and the there's a bijection between the parts of the partition and the trees so that the vertices of that part are in that tree. Great, thank you. Yeah, good, thank you for asking. Okay, <laughs> um, all right, so this is all fine and good, but what, where the story that led to the conference that's part of all these things that are exciting our organizers and things like that, it didn't really come from exactly this. came from somewhere else, which is that, well, something that many parts of it are classical, but some more recent uh, uh, aspects of it have been pursued by Dirk and Spencer and Marco and various other people, um, is, is understanding about how uh, the, the cuts, the, the cuts of the graph tell us about the monodromy, right? So that's And so to very briefly sketch what's going on, I haven't even said what a cut is yet, but I will soon. Um, you can use your intuition uh, and an example. So if we have a graph here with some external edges, uh, and then you might have a cut. And what do I really mean by a cut? I mean something. I cut it. All right. And we'll get down to a definition in a moment. Um, but given a cut, you have some momentum going through it. So you have this S again. Yes, this guy here for that cut. And now you could write the Feynman integral. You, the Feynman integral is dependent on all of the external momenta. Um, but let's isolate the S dependence and then there's the rest of it, right? So you could write. Uh, 
spell so it's summer normal i find the rules on some bra and i want to think of this as a function of s and then i want to think of it as a function of the rest of them because i don't really care about the rest of them right now okay so that's all fine and good but the point is well <laughs> that's the problem with the wet boards the tray is gross anyway um so if you think about this as a function of s well there's a singularity at some point uh it's at the point where those momenta through there are all on shell and you might want to understand what's going on around that singularity and that's the monodromy question that uh understanding these cuts tells you about right so um so considering this Singularity and if you want to understand what's going on around it, so this guy with the imaginary part here, and I'm sorry for saying things, classical things that many of you already know, but this guy you can get by calculating on the graph where you just remove the cut edges. So you actually, or you don't remove them, you put them on shell, where you actually cut the cut. Um, and furthermore, so finally, in my brief summary, for this story, for the second semantic story, you only care about cutting into two pieces, but as with the spanning force polynomials that you can write for any number of pieces, and when I'm doing C2 calculations, I do care about spanning force polynomials that cut into many pieces. Uh, in this story, you do too. So uh, you also care about cutting into more than two pieces. And these are things that are called anomalous thresholds. And uh, OK, so that's that's my very brief overview of why some people, including our organizers, got interested in cuts and that which led to the sort of interactions that caused this conference. All right. So, yeah, I should say what I mean by a cut in this context. I should say. I don't know about you guys, but. Uh, this is my first in-person conference and my first travel, and I feel like I'm a little out of practice. <laughs> so especially with the timing, right? I, I don't know about you guys, but it used to be when you did a lot of this sort of stuff, you knew exactly how long the talk was, and you could just time it in your head, and I'm a little out of practice. Anyway, what do I really want to mean? Uh, what, what is the definition of cut that we want here? Well, you're going to mostly think about the cut as a set of edges. So uh, it's a set C of edges of G. And what properties we want it to have? Well, if we remove C from G, we would like the result to have two or more components. And furthermore, all of the edges were somehow necessary. Uh, so there's no edge of C that has both of its ends in the same component of G minus C. So you never cut something that stayed within a component because uh, that you really didn't need to cut that guy. teach second year graph theory or I guess I'm probably the only one at a university that has graph theory in second year but at some point uh, when you teach your graph theory your first graph theory course you may talk about cuts and you probably use a different formulation of the definition but it's really the same object uh, because typically in a graph theory context typically in the graph theory context you define your cut well, if it's a cut into two pieces by a bipartition 
of the edges uh, of the vertices of the graph uh, and otherwise I'll partition into more pieces. Uh, uh, so but it's, so it's the same object, but it's a different setup. There you define a cut, define cut um, uh, partition of all vertices, partition of all of G, and then well, you will define a cut, let's say, as a partition of the vertices. But then the edges of the cut are exactly the edges that have uh, ends in two different parts of the partition. All right, and at least I'm not completely out of practice on board use because I came back to exactly where I want to do, which is there is an interesting little diversion we could go on about cut spaces. But I'm not going to because otherwise I'll be out of time. Okay. So what's the second? So that's what is the deal with cuts? Okay, but I have said nothing new or interesting. This is just some motivation. And there's another piece of the motivation that's really important. Um, and that is about fixing a spanning. So what's the story here? And this is again, something that we've seen in some of the talks already here. Uh, so it's something that comes up from, from many of our different perspectives of people in the room is that maybe instead of a graph, you'd like to have a pair of a graph and a spanning tree. Um, and again, Marco and Dirk can tell you many more things about why this is an interesting thing to do in quantum field theory. Uh, and when uh, the other Karen maybe will tell us something that might have something to do with also uh, indirect, like why that's an interesting thing in, in quantum field theory. Uh, but that's for now, let's just say that's what we're going to do. So, you might want to make instead of a graph, a graph spanning tree pair. Okay, and let's just have a little running example because that's um, always useful. So here's a, a simple little guy. Um, there's a number of spanning trees I could pick, but I'm going to use color and I've not made all the colors fall on the floor. Let's take this spanning. Just... Okay. Now, Whenever you have a spanning tree that identifies some special cuts. So how does a tree identify a cut? Well, anytime you have a subset of edges of the tree, you could remove those edges from the tree and that would give you a forest. And it would be spanning forest as, as long as you allow the uh, isolated vertices as trees under spanning forest. Uh, and so, if you have any spanning subgraph, the vertices of the components give you a partition, um, and that give a partition of the vertices, and so you get a cut in this sense. So it defines a cut. Uh, so any subset of the vertices of the tree define a cut of G. And those are nice cuts. Um, so maybe while I'm erasing, let me just make a few comments without necessarily writing them down about those cuts specifically. Somehow the trick is to the right amount of water. So if we remove only single edges of the tree, 
So we only take subsets of size one of the edges of the tree. Uh, then, well, actually, first, let's just notice you don't get all cuts this way. And if you look at that example graph there, you can probably think of a cut that you won't get. But even though you don't get all of them, you do get a bunch of interesting ones. So let's let's actually do the example. Um, so if I draw this guy again, okay. Uh, so just for example, if I say I'm going to remove this guy, well, what does that do? The bipartition is now this guy is one component. And these three are the other component. So this gives exactly that cut, which was already on this board before I erased it. But here's a cut you can't get. Um, you could not, for instance, well, this isn't a valid cut in the second semantic sense, but it's still a cut. For instance, you couldn't get this cut because if you were to actually cut all of the edges of the spanning tree, that would break this into one, um, one, two, three, four components. So that would not be this cut. That would be this cut where just everything is cut and it's just broken into isolated verses. Uh, so this is not a cut that can be achieved through uh, cutting a subset of edges of this spanning tree, but that's okay. So here are the two notes. If you cut single edges, uh, cutting single tree edges, this gives a basis for the cut space that I didn't talk about. Before. All right, fine. Um, the other comment is, if you sum over all of the spanning trees, then you will be able to get all of the cuts. And so originally we, we fixed a particular spanning tree, but if I go over different spanning trees, I can get everything. Okay, so that's nice. And these are still really useful. And so that is, um, fact A that I want us to remember. So I'm gonna just make, I have a collection of digressions, but I also want a little collection of facts. Back here. So, yeah, so I just want to say subsets of the edges from the tree. That's, that's fact. Okay. When you fix a spanning tree, as well as getting cuts, you get this sort of special family of cuts. You also get special cycles, and these are called fundamental cycles. Did I say trees at the beginning of that sentence? When you fix a tree, which is what I was meant to say, I'm not sure if I did. Also, and how does this work? Um, these are called fundamental cycles. in the graph theory sense, not in the other senses in which that is used in mathematics. <laughs> um, so how does this work? If you take any non-tree edge, E, then you've got the graph T plus E. And again, this might be something you would teach in your second year graph theory class, uh, that this graph here is, has a unique cycle. So um, is a graph of a unique cycle. That's the one, right? So the edge E determines this cycle. We'll call that the fundamental cycle determined by T. Okay, so 
so um, I guess that calls for an example. Uh, an example here. No, I don't That's going to be streaky, I think. <laughs> so here's an example. Let's take a slightly larger example. Um, let's just do a three, four. Okay, and let's fix a spanning tree. And now let's pick another edge. So let's say I pick this edge. That's my E. So for this E, I'm going to get this guy as the fundamental cycle. Okay. Uh, let's do another one. Let's take this guy. Let's go here. This guy would give me this four cycle as the fundamental cycle. And now here's another observation I want to make that now if I take more than one edge that's not in the tree, I could add them in and I could just take the union of the fundamental cycles that I get, not a disjoint union, but a union in this graph. And what am I going to get that way? Well, I'm going to get a graph that's made up of a union of cycles. So that is exactly the class of bridgeless graphs or in the more uh, fun diagram language, the class of 1PI graphs. Although notice they wouldn't necessarily have to be connected. I can't make an example in that graph, but in a larger graph, if I have two cycles that are far enough apart, I can get them just, the, then they really would be disjoint because uh, their union inside the graph is disjoint. Um, so subsets of this, the edges of the graph minus the edges of the tree give, um, bridgeless subgraphs. Okay. Again, nothing really that exciting. Okay. Now let's talk about some coproducts. So, First, I just want to write down the definition of an incidence by uh, an incidence coalgebra. I just need the coalgebra structure. So, this is a slightly a digression, but it's a digression taken. So, I'm going to put it here rather than over there. So, I'm given a coset S with partial order equal to then interval. The interval in this coset is what you would think. It's the set of guys in the middle. And the set of intervals um, is uh, a coalgebra under with. So what do you do for the coproduct? I'm going to call this coproduct rho for reasons that will be obvious later. Well, you just sum over all the guys in the middle. Oh, given a, uh, I better make it locally finite just to keep things simple. So this is just over the guys in the middle. Um, and unit just a, uh, um, just a Kronecker delta. All right, and that guy is uh, the incidence coalgebra for that coset. All right. Well, what do we have here? We had our GT. So what do we want? Let's form the incidence coalgebra um, 
on the power set of the edges of the. Okay. So notice that we said, well, subsets of the edges of the tree give cuts. So we have a nice interpretation of the elements of the power set, but the incidence coalgebra is based on intervals, not just elements. So how are we going to interpret an interval? Um, if I have an interval, oh, and of course, on the power set, I'm going to use the subset relation as the relation for my coset. I'm sure you figured that out, but I didn't say it, so now I have. So how are we going to interpret this? Um, um, so we're going to take the cut defined by A, and then, okay, B has to be something, B has to be a superset of A, so that B can't be a set that I can't, don't cut, but the complement of B, that's something that's definitely outside the cut, and so that can be a set of edges that I'm promising to not cut, so and, um, the edges of the tree minus B uh, as uh, edges that are set to be uncuttable. Uncut <coughs> Notice that that's equivalent to contracting them. Because if they're uncuttable, you're saying they are definitely going to be in there. Whatever game you're playing, they are there. Well, you might as well just, I mean, they're, they're there, right? You have to take them. So they're, you might as well contract them. And so this is just little thing C, which is, um, I will call the uh, incidence co-product there still rho this, on this, in this example. So we're going to take rho as the incidence on uh, the power set of the And this is a, like, a, this is a cut and contract co-product. It's not the classic cut and contract. It's a, it's a different, but it's a, it's marking, cutting, and contracting. Okay. So that's that's something. By cut and contract, you mean the concave or idea of no, I mean, I mean exactly this. In that sense. I mean, yeah. So that's why I said it's a kind of cutting contract. It's not. I don't mean it in the usual Kahn-Kramer sense. We'll see the usual Kahn-Kramer Hopf algebra in a moment, um, or well, we'll see the core Hopf algebra in a moment, which is not quite the same. But uh, I actually, I literally mean just this. So we have intervals. The intervals are keeping information of cut, of, cut and uncuttable, uh, and then the co-product is actually on the intervals. So it's actually on these. Uh, it's on these markings. They're marking certain edges as cut and certain edges as uncuttable. Okay, well, that was something built out of the edges of the tree, and we said that the edges of the tree determine counts. Okay, but the edges that are not in the tree determine bridge of subgraphs. And guess what? If we're making the normalization Hopf algebras or core Hopf algebras, then we want to see the uh, bridge of subgraphs. So the second guy is what we want to get something more like von Kramer. So now consider. Uh, I'm going to call this EL, which is the edges of the graph that are not the edges of the tree. And as we said up there, a subset of EL determines a bridge of subgraph. Uh, and many of you probably know the core Hopf algebra or core coproduct. Um, uh, which is this guy. You take a sum over all bridgeless subgraphs. And 
you can just subtract the subgraph on the other side. Um, and this is the one that's closely related to renormalization because if you additionally put in the information of who is divergent in your particular field theory, then you get exactly what you want because renormalization and that's all the beautiful stuff that many people in this room have been involved in. Uh, yeah, so this, this guy is sort of, it's sort of flashing renormalization at you even though we're doing the core guy at the moment. Now, this is not quite the situation that we're in right now because we went ahead and fixed the spanning tree at some stage. And so as, oh, I forgot to notice, uh, but in the same way that when you fix a spanning tree, you don't get all of the cuts, you also don't get all of the cycles here. And so let me just add a little note. Note these form a basis of the cycle space, um, but um, they don't give all of them. If you sum over trees, you do in fact get all. Uh, but in our context, if we have a fixed tree, then we don't get all of them. Fine. So instead of this co-product, we want this guy, which is almost the same. So for a GT pair, you're going to still, you still want this to be bridgeless, but it's also got to be, well, I'm going to write the word compatible again. Sorry to everybody. It's got to be compatible with T. Okay. And so then this would be a gamma and T intersect gamma. And on the other side of the co-product, you're going to have G contract gamma, and you're going to have T contract the stuff that was gamma there. And now what does compatible mean in this case? Well, compatible means that this guy and this guy are still both spanning trees of their respective graphs. But that corresponds exactly to the fact that their sets of cycles that you could obtain out of the fundamental cycles because they're the ones that are built out of, out of the bits of tree, basically. So there's another way I can write this co-product. I can write it as a sum over just subsets of EL. And then, well, I'm not going to define notation for this. But here, if I have, as we said, if we have a subset of the non-tree edges, that gives me a subgraph, so this is just a subgraph um, determined by S. On the other side, well, uh, dare I say it's the co-graph determined by EL minus S, <laughs> because once you know what S is, you know what you want it to contract, and so that, that also determines the co-graph. And I appreciate that's kind of vague because I didn't want to uh, take the time <coughs> to define notation for everything right at the moment. But what this means is, if I go back up here, <coughs> all right, I overdid the wet this time. Right. Another aspect of being out of practice. Um. So anyway, the point is You write this delta as just really all it needs is that is hmm, I don't want to call it uh, s uh, uh, another set <laughs> s prime. Um, all I really need to know is the subset of edges because the subset of non-tree edges because that tells me everything. And then even if I wanted to work on a subgraph and inside that subgraph, I wanted to use this co-product. All I'm doing is I'm taking now the subsets of that guy and I'm taking S and then I'm taking S 
oops, I'm taking S and I'm taking S prime minus S. The point is um, you can view the core Hopf algebra in this tree context as actually just being subset complement coproduct on the set of non-tree edges. So that is point number D. So delta here is a core coproduct with tree T, but then that's also um, it's the subset complement. Okay, well, it's getting close to time for me to finish up. Uh, I think I have about 15. No, I don't because I want questions. I probably have about five minutes, right? Not all 15 minutes. Oh, we do have 15 minutes. Okay, fine. Good, because there's another page. Uh, <laughs> so these are all the objects that I want to talk about. And this is, I hope, a very vague background of why you might care about them and why they have something to do with quantum field theory, because we have this guy, which is telling us about the cuts in this um, threshold sense. We have this guy, which is telling us about the core coproducts, products or telling us about the normalization story. We phrase them both in terms of edge subsets. So there's a rephrasing this one as an incidence coproduct and a rephrasing of this one as a subset complement coproduct uh, in terms of subsets of edges of the tree and subsets of edges not of the tree. And so now they sort of live on a common footing and that gives us a good context in which to talk about how they relate to each other. And the answer is they're in co-interaction. So let's just note that from a physical mindset, they should relate in some kind of reasonable way because you should expect that the renormalization and the monodromy of the climate intervals should relate in some sort of sensible way. Although exactly what sensible way, you would have to be a better physicist than me to guess, but I think maybe the good physicists all need to have an idea how it should relate. Let's also note that mathematically it makes sense that they should relate pretty nicely because Notice they're defined in terms of complementary sets of edges. So although they are talking to each other because they're defined on the same graphs, they're somehow actually playing with different parts of the graph. So they're somehow independent. Um, and exactly the notion of somehow, I will write down in just a few boards. So, well, actually, first I'm gonna write down the definition of what I mean by co-interaction, uh, and then we'll, then we'll look at it in, in this context. So here's the definition. So let's say we have two bialgebras. Yeah. Which is going to be four row. that well what do we really want we want that the structure maps of a are co-module morphisms e what is that i think i got the right guy i think i got that right I, anyway the, the the four conditions i'm about to write down are definitely correct um and algebraic people can check if I've, I think that's right though. So what do we want? Well, there's some sort of the easy ones, right? You need the identity to be well behaved. You need, well, this is sort of the interesting one maybe, is it's telling you how the two co-products almost commute. And now here, Notice here I'm breaking into two pieces and I'm breaking two pieces, but I'm leaving this alone. And so here 
I've broken it into four pieces. I need to put two of the pieces back together. And how exactly am I going to do that? I'm going to do it with, uh, well, we're going to write M1324. So it's a multiplication. It leaves the one alone. It leaves the three slot alone. And then it puts the two and four slot and multiplies them together and puts it in the last slot. So that guy. Okay. And then we need, so uh, we already said that, but we also need rho to respect the multiplication. And um, A, B. And we also need uh, that the, the co-unit does the right thing here as well. So it should look like this. So A, A. Oh, and that's for all A and A. Wait, the definition isn't quite finished. It's short a sentence, but I'll have to put it here. Because let these be bioalgebras with blah such that blah, then I have to say something. But what I say is that the bioalgebras are in co interaction. Well, and I said that I said this, but it's not my definition. So um, I learned about this from, from Lloyd Foisy, but I know that uh, it's not originally due to him either. It's, well, at some level, it's really just that they're, that they're the right sort of objects um, with respect to that co-action. But I think some of the some of those French algebraist people have been uh, pursuing some interesting combinatorial examples um, of these guys recently. So that that community's been playing with them. Okay, so let's finish the sentence. Uh, uh, then, more algebras are in co interaction. Um, and uh, interest an interesting special case is when. Uh, the multiplicative side, the, the algebra side are the same. And well, in that case, then I can just use delta as rho. And we're going to, well, with a few caveats, we're going to be thinking in that context. Okay, well. It almost feels like I don't have anything left to say because I set up some maps and I set up a definition and the notation is, you know, like delta is probably delta and rho is probably rho, right? And then I'm probably going to say, look, they're in co-interaction. But there are a few more details that I have to say to be able to actually say that correctly. Uh, but essentially that is where we're going. So you already have the punchline. You can go have your cup of coffee now and forget about it. If you I don't want to see a few last details. So how do we put the pieces together? Well, um, so far, rho and delta are not acting on the same space. So they couldn't possibly do any of this stuff. Uh, so let's put, put them all together. So let's put both rho and delta, our rho and delta, on a space of formal symbols. Um, so I'm going to write. B, I, I'm going to put basically an interval in a superscript, but this is really just a symbol. This is just, this is just a thing. Uh, and so B, it's going to be a subset of EL. And on a space of these, so it's the span of these guys, space of these guys. Uh, where you use a subset of L um, and A1, A2 
Well, it should be an interval, but where exactly should it be an interval? So I don't want to have this interval on the whole graph. I've got a single fixed graph and tree, just, just up at the very top, I've got a fixed graph and tree. And now I don't want this to be just an interval in the power set of the tree edges, because not all the tree edges are part of the subset, the subgraph defined by B, right? So B is a set of non-tree edges, so it defines a bridgeless subgraph. And now I want this interval to be an interval in the tree edges of B. Okay, but not literally of B because B is a subset of non-tree edges. So this is where I need finally some notation for the fundamental cycles, right? So whenever I have a non-tree edge, that determines a fundamental cycle. And I'm gonna let the map that does that be F. So F going from EL to the power set of the edges of the tree is the map of the fundamental cycles. Right, so given an edge that's not in the tree, it determines a cycle. I'm going to treat that cycle as just the subset of edges of the cycle. All right, and now, then where should this be an interval in? It should be an interval in F applied to everything in B. So power set of F. All right? Because that means that's an interval on the tree edges of the subgraph that B is really supposed to be defining. So this weird notation this really is just a subgraph of our fixed big parent graph with a marked set of cut edges and a marked set of uncuttable edges. So it's just a very weird notation for that. Uh, we allow parallel edges or not? If we were just at the tree edges of the cycle, I would now close it. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Um, yeah, I guess it doesn't, why don't we just not allow it for now and then that solves okay. the problem. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, but but let's just not worry about parallel edges because somehow those are very unexciting subdivergences. So I don't even care about leaving them out right from the word go. Um, okay. So then, um, delta. Oh, my delta, is delta is just acting on the B part, and then you restrict and then you restrict the interval. And so you've got you have some subset of B on the one side of the tensor, and you just restrict the A1 and A2 to the to the new F of B1. And similarly on the other side. Rho just acts on the A1 and 2 part. Um, notice we can add some restrictions if there's certain edges that we want that they can never be tadpoles. Uh, so if we have certain edges that have contraction restrictions, we can add that in. And so if you actually look in the paper, there is a little bit of extra machinery to have certain edges that may not be tadpoles. Um, and it, but it doesn't fundamentally change anything. It just puts a few extra bits of notation here and there. And, um, uh, set of tadpoles. This is something you might very well want to do physically, uh, especially if you have a mix of massive and massless edges uh, or something like that. Okay, and now there's still something missing, 
And you would think that it's the easiest part, but there's actually a subtlety here because did I erase my definition? Oh, bad strategy. The definition was right here. Oh, well. Well, what did it say? It said I had two bialgebras, A multiplication A and one coproduct, B multiplication B and the other coproduct. And then I said, well, I care most about the case when the multiplications and the sets are the same. Okay, but what's the multiplication? I haven't said what the multiplication is yet. Now, if you're used to playing these Conheimer type games, you're used to multiplication being disjoint union. And it's somehow just sort of trivial, right? It's just like just monomials in all the combinatorial objects, right? But that doesn't work here. And the reason it doesn't work here, well, there's sort of two sides to it. So you can think about it a couple of different ways. One reason it doesn't work here is because we have a fixed parent graph and everything is supposed to be in terms of that fixed parent graph. Everything lives inside it. So I can't just willy-nilly disjoint union things. I have to see them in that one graph. Um, yeah, okay, I think I'll just, that's a way to see it. So that's, that, yeah, that's, I guess it's also another consequence of just the way we're thinking of a subgraph, because since we're building them out of the fundamental cycles, we're building them as a product of fundamental cycles, basically, is how we want to set it up. And so that's the multiplication we want. So I uh, want M to be union inside the fixed group G. And let's write that down. So if I have a multiplication of some B1 and some interval A1, A2, a B2 and an interval A3, A4, well, what should that be? B1 and B2, those were the edges that were not in the tree that were defining the sets of fundamental cycles. So for the union graph, I should take all the guys in B1 and all the guys in B2. So to start, I want something like a B1 union B2. But now I don't actually want to have the same fundamental cycle showing up more than once. So I only want to do this if they're actually disjoint. So if um, B1 intersect B2 equals M2. Now notice this is not saying that the subgraphs defined by B1 and B2 are disjoint. They probably, they often won't be, but the sets of non-tree edges that are defining them should be disjoint. Uh, otherwise I, I have a tough some multiplicities and I don't want to go there. Okay, what is the interval gonna turn into? Well, this is the stuff that's cut. So ideally you'd just like to union that together. And this is the stuff well, this is all the stuff that is still cuttable because the complement of A2 and the complement of A4 is the stuff that cannot be cut. So again, ideally, you'd like to just union that. Uh, but that doesn't always work because what if something, because the, these sets, there could be some overlap, right? Because if the subgraphs defined here had overlap, so they have tree edges in common, but on one side I said to do something and on the other side I said to do something else, well, that's a problem. So I can only do this if these sets, the, the, what I've said to do is compatible on the intersection. And so how am I going to write that? So if this happens, and also I want to say that A1, the idea is it should be equal to A3, but it doesn't have to be equal to A3 everywhere. It just has to be equal to A3 when it's, Okay, I'm going to write it as a restriction, but I really just need intersection. But I want to think of it as restricted to the subset. And what is the subset? It's f of b1 intersect f of b2. Okay, and this is restricted to the same subset. And you also have to have a2 restricted to that same subset is equal to a4 restricted to that same subset. So if all of those things happen, then you just union everything together in the way that you would think to build the subgraph. And if those things don't happen, then you're toast. And that's fine because setting it to zero is no problem. Okay. Well, that's the multiplication. And the time is up. 
So the theorem is that these guys with these operations are in co-interaction and that that ought to tell you something about the physics because both of the two parts have physical meaning. And the proof that they're in co-interaction is you just do it. There's nothing really deep there. You do it and it works out and then you're happy. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Question for remarks, please. I have a question, Karen. Can yeah. you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, can, can you formulate uh, this without fixing a spanning tree, just in terms of graphs? Um, yeah, I. I... I, we should have probably worked that out sooner. I, I don't. I don't know for sure, but I suspect so. I haven't done. Because there's this. Uh, there's a couple of works where people do something that's related to the motivic coaction, and they write down some formula where they sum over a certain set of edges that they cut, and then the other ones are contracted. And so there is a co-product that has something to do with cuts. And I was just wondering if this is in any way related to. Uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think the answer to both your questions is both questions probably should have the answer yes, but I don't actually know. I haven't sat down to work it out without the tree. There are a few subtleties to how you would set it up, but I think it should work out. And I, d I don't know about the about the okay. product, but I would. Yeah, again, it's made out of the same object, so it sort of should be. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think the the main. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. No, you Maybe. can address if you want. <laughs> There's maybe one remark I have. There are some people like Clodure and collaborators who have this co-action there. And all the subtleties like, like really in how you treat tadpoles and how you treat the uh, demand minimal subtraction versus kinematic randomization schemes. Because we have the funny situation in the kinematic randomization schemes, tadpoles would automatically go to zero. In say minimal subtraction, they only go to zero if it comes if they, they are massless, because yeah, obviously. And so you have a couple of interesting ideals or something like that to divide through to compare these situations with all the subtleties, all the differences almost between Dürr and us lie that Dürr is a little bit, in my opinion, a little bit imprecise in working out what tadpoles are really doing for him if he would do LSAT randomization. And if you work that out, then I think there is only one way to find co-action for monotromy on the market, and we all agree on what it is. And that's, that's why it's important that in this framework you can, yeah. you can sort of exclude or not exclude tadpoles or exclude just some of them. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the story works. If, uh, if I may ask a second question, if nobody else goes. Um, I mean, there's also a question of, of iterated discontinuities and iterated cuts, right? Uh, have you thought about that? Well, so notice that this allows cuts into arbitrarily many pieces. So for this setup at the moment, we're not keeping track of a pattern of, of what the order was, but, but those are all in this co-product. So if you did and if you iterated this co-product and took the parts that were sort of minimal at each, like the longest iteration you could get, then that would give you the information of iterated cuts. So, so does the cut co-product only cut into one more connected component or does, does no, the cut co-product also have terms? More. It cuts into any number more. Ah. But then if you iterated it, you, you could pick out the ones that cut into just one more. But but it doesn't it doesn't answer the question yet, and maybe this can't be answered so easily. What happens if you cut in a way that you get that you get the product of distribution which have coinciding support? Mm -hmm. And so if you have, for example, a ladder graph, a four-point ladder function, and then you cut vertically after each ladder, this can give you very dangerous situations because. You have monotromy at q squared equals m1 plus m2 squared. But if all the ladder rungs have the same mass, then uh, you're multiplying distributions which have similar support. And that's 
that's something which is subtle and that's something and that's a question Lance Dixon once asked me if we have an idea if there is a good mathematical rule for that but that is more general than what we are doing now and right now I think there is no canonical answer in the literature apart from saying I make the masses different and take the limit in some order yeah, this is much more naive. This is any cut that's combinatorially there is acceptable yeah. from this point of view. And so these kind of questions uh, are not really addressed here. And this is a solution to these questions. A simple solution is to give an external momentum to each vertex in your graph, because then you are never at the same kinematical point. So, yeah. But then you have to ask yourself what happens if the external momentum go to zero. And uh, that's again then subtle. So for Karen Fogman, I would like to take graphs which have the num maximum number of external leaves, the maximum possible number. Every vertex has an external leaf, and then that's a canonical situation. Everything else makes life miserable. Yeah, I mean, from a pure combinatorics perspective, there's just a bunch of terms that would go to zero, but then, then there's other subtleties when you actually want to integrate them. So I'm not going to go there. But if you start with a graph, you can stick in edges at every, all along every edge and get arbitrarily many external momentum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that is not as bad as the situation when you have many, when you have none, non-trivial vertices or internal trivial three valent vertices and you forget to put an external edge on them. That gives you analytically very bad situations if you want to have bad situations. Unless you keep the math as generic. Yeah, keep the situation as generic and unspecified as possible. So I have a question about this co-product. So you took a graph in a tree, a maximal tree. Mm -hmm. uh, what could, and you say you iterate this co-product and that divides all the trees into smaller pieces. Can you just define it on the level of a graph in a forest to start with? Um, yeah, yeah, you could. Uh, but then from this perspective, there'd sort of be one cut that had already been made in the tree, in the graph to start with. That, it's just always there, and then you're cutting inside that. Actually, there's a nice representation of the story in terms of lower triangular matrices. And if you start with a forest instead of a tree, then you are just looking at a sub matrix of that matrix, which is to the right a little bit. Another way you can see it is uh, there's, there are special intervals that start with empty because those are the ones that don't cut anything. Um, and if you look at the shape of the coproduct of, of the incidence coproduct, if you have, if you taking a coproduct of empty something, then the terms on the left-hand side are always gonna be of the form empty something. Um, and so there's, a, there's another coaction there that's going from sort of the, the tree parts where you don't cut anything uh, and just with the rest on the other side. But you could start with an interval where you'd already cut something. And that would be the case Karen was asking about. Because that would having an interval where you've already cut something would be equivalent to starting with a forest instead of a tree. Thanks. It's a very simple question. Um, I forgot uh, at what point the information about the external legs enters your definition of the co product. It doesn't. That's what Dirk was sort of saying. We're not doing any, we're not doing something that actually throws out the terms that would have to be zero. Ah. So it's it's more naive than that. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think- So it's, it's really for, for, for a commentary graph without legs. Yeah, at the, yeah, this part is. At the beginning when I was giving some motivation, I was talking about external edges, but this this story is really just about graphs. Um, because at a from this pure combinatorial side, the only thing that happens is some stuff goes to zero. I don't think it would be too hard to incorporate, but that's not what we've done so far. I have a weird comment, but then I want to discuss this. Okay, so it looks like this is some sort of nice generalization. So instead of taking uh, what you took the left was the minimum, but you could take the right, the maximum as well. And then you also could take the full uh, 
co-product of the maximum interval, right? Yep. And that, that should be what we talked about. That should be the side diagonal of the, of the corresponding mm -hmm. side diagonal on the group of the complex. Okay. Which means you sort of decide you just take a power set, you cut half of the, you know, you cut one side of the of the edges and you contract the other. So it's like yeah. it's the full, it's a full uh, business. So that's actually interesting. And I wonder about this. So, and then maybe for Dirk later or you later, how is this related to these variational matrices? I mean, you have a lower triangular matrix. How is this related? Can, can one say something like this? You can write down explicitly what the action looks like on the matrix. Yeah, but I mean, I, you have your old matrices, which sort of didn't care about whatever cuts in the sense. Yeah, they did, they did care about cuts. So yeah, like the matrices related, had the cuts in them. Yeah, they had cuts, sorry. How are the old, related, old matrices related to the new ones you're talking about? Um, I think you're really just talking about the old matrices and you have an operation on them. Yeah. Maybe, I, maybe we need to sit down and talk about yeah. 100% sure what you're saying. Yeah. And actually, just for other people who care about complexes in general, uh, I didn't really say this, but because we have an incidence Hopf algebra on a power, like using a subset operation, that's really just, that's just a binary zero one situation. So that is in fact, just, mm -hmm. just a generalized cube. And so that's how we get into these cubicle, uh, the cubicle things that, uh, that Ralph was talking about. I just phrase it in a different language because that's the language that's more comfortable for me. <laughs> And it's about incidence, which makes a connection to these other co-algebra people. That's a remark for Eric. Yeah, I like incidence half much. So is there, is there, in terms of physics, a punchline at the end that these two co-products being in co-interaction? Yes, yes. You could actually calculate your final graph in dim reg, not renormalizing it. Determines the monotomy and then renormalize re -normalize your result. Or you could actually renormalize re first and then determine your monotomy. And at least in sensible randomization schemes, the answer is the same. And in non sensible randomization schemes, you have to think about tadpoles a little bit. Yeah, so you can basically just, if you take the, the co interaction formula that got erased and just apply fine rules, yeah. then you're good. Okay, are there further comments, remarks? Digitally? No. Okay, then let's thank Karen again.